Grace Church. It is so good to be together today. Hey, if you're new with us, we just want to let you know what this service is going to be like. First, we're going to start out with some worship. You can feel free to sing along or listen, however you feel comfortable. Next, we're going to talk about what's going on in our church community, followed by a teaching from the Bible. We hope that it encourages you on your faith journey and helps to introduce you to the real Jesus. If you're ever wondering what's going on in our church, make sure that you hit us up on our website. That's gracechurch.com. That's church without the U. And then find us on social media on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. There's a whole lot more to explore. All right, church, let's get started. All right, well, good morning, Grace Church. Let's get ready to worship Jesus. We love you. We want more of you. We want to be more like you. So this time we invite you to our homes, our house. God, we allow you to be king of kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. 
church, God is good. Well, Jesus, we love you. We worship you.
Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Father, we know who you are and we know what you do, God, and we know what you can do. So, God, we give you the glory this morning. We celebrate you. And Jesus, God, as we continue throughout the sermon, God, would you begin to speak life, God, would you can continue to allow it to breathe life into us. So, Jesus, we love you and we worship you. And everybody said, amen. Good morning, Grace Church. Nicole here, filming from downstairs in our newly refreshed nursery space. If you have not been down here in a while, please take a minute when you're on campus with us next to just take a peek at what um, new decor and fun things that we have. Welcome to our final Sabbath Sunday of the summer. We are so happy that you're tuning in for wherever you find yourself this morning. Uh, last week, we heard from Chad Eisenhart, the director of Foursquare Disaster Relief, about the work that that ministry does. I'm very excited to report that through your partnership in giving, we were able to send FDR $5,000 this week to help in Haiti and the Gulf Coast. Thank you so much, Grace Community, for stepping up as usual to serve the needs of people who need it most. Let's pray together over our time of giving today. Lord Jesus, thank you for using our church to provide for the needs of people far and wide. As we give today, I ask that you would do a mighty work through the generosity of the people. Use these gifts, God, to advance your kingdom here in our neighborhood and far beyond it. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, good morning, Grace family. Last week, we had these serve cards for you to be able to fill out and turn back into us, and they are here to stay. If you're still looking for a spot to be able to serve, to get plugged in at at Grace, you can go onto our website, gracechurch.com, click on the serve tab, answer a few questions on the back, or next week, you can come and fill out one of these cards, fill out the back, turn it into us, and we'll shoot you an email, we'll contact you, we will get you connected. Next week is going to be an amazing week. We can't wait. It's our last Super Sunday. Sunday of the summer, which means we got to go bigger and better than the other ones, right? We're going to have a pizza truck and a kid zone, and it's going to be a blast. It's also communion Sunday. So for those of you who follow along online, you might want to prepare some materials ahead of time so you can partake in community with us during communion. And it is our theme launch. So it is a big week. We can't wait. But this week we have Pastor Kari bringing the word for our last summer Sabbath. Here we go. Well, hello. Good morning, church. It is so good to see you through the screen for our final summer Sabbath Sunday. This is a church at home week. We have had three of these this summer where we have encouraged our Grace Church family to spend time at home and rest. You know, the Bible is really, really clear that we need patterns of rest. And so we've been trying this out this summer and it has been awesome. But I'm so glad that we can still connect through the screen for Church at Home. And today, I am going to be finishing up our series called One Another. If I haven't met you yet, my name is Kari. I'm one of the pastors here. My husband, Elisha, and I are, are the associate pastors. And we love being a part of Grace Church. In the last few weeks, Pastor Omar has been taking us through a series that is about what it is to be in relationship with one another as believers in the church. In scripture, we see over a hundred times the phrase one another applied. And whenever it is about people's relationships with one another, one of the things that we learn is how important relationship is to followers of Jesus. That we are not called to do this walk with God alone, though we may be tuning in from home right now. It is implied as a follower of Jesus that we have relationship with one another. We have learned in the last few weeks about encouraging each other, about having relationship, deep relationship with each other. Last week, Pastor Chad Eisenhart was here from Foursquare Disaster Relief, and he was talking about how we can serve one another, serve people's needs in the darkest moments and bring them the hope of Jesus. Now this week in our final 
week of the One Another series, we're going to be talking about kind of the capstone project of this whole thing. Everything we've learned up until this point gets put together, our, our, our skills put to use in the subject of forgiveness. It's a heavy topic, and we are going to go briefly into it today. But before we do that, can you pray with me? Lord God, we love you. God, I pray today as we get into the scriptures, we would learn from you. God, I thank you that your word is holy. God, I thank you that your scripture gives us life and direction where we have none. God, I pray that today as we get into the book of Colossians, your word would come alive to me and to everyone hearing the sound of my voice. Lord God, I pray that wherever we are right now, you would be with us, Holy Spirit, and just silence the voice of the enemy in Jesus' name. We want to lift your name. Hi, Jesus your name we pray. Amen. Well, this last week has been a big week for a lot of us. If you have school-aged kids in your home or if you work in the school system, you know that here in Federal Way, we had our first week of school. And it was a big deal for our family. Our son, our oldest son, Law, is now in second grade. And it's his first, this last week, he had his first day of full day instruction since March 2020. He had last year done a couple of months of four half days a week, but this was his first four-way, four-way back into this classroom all day long, and he is loving it, and we're loving it too. The funny thing is, though, is that when he started staying home a year and a half ago, he was right in the middle of his kindergarten year, so his first year of school. And I remember then I thought, oh my goodness, like he's growing up so fast. He's gone so much. And it was just like this gift to get him back home with our two younger kids and extend that little kidness a little bit longer. And though he did first grade last year, in my husband and my mind, he still kind of seemed like a kindergartner to us because that's where the school process had stopped abruptly. And so as we got ready for his first day of school this last week, you know, we got him a haircut and new clothes. And by this point, he needs a new backpack. And he just had grown up. I mean, as his like pound and a half of hair was removed, seriously, this kid has incredibly thick hair. So much hair was removed, new clothes put on. In our eyes, he grew like six inches. He gained like three years of life. We could not believe how much older he looked. But as we looked at him, we realized, oh my goodness, he's been this kid for the last few months. And we just had not even noticed. He's not being someone he's not. He's actually becoming more of who he really is. We got to see this new mature kid going into school as a second grader and having, having big kid friendships is what it feels like to us. It was like he was a new person. And and that so resonated with me this week as I was reading in the book of Colossians. Because today we're going to be in Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 15. But before we get to that point, Paul had kind of, he's the writer of the letter, he set up the concepts that we're going to go into. He's talking in this section of scripture about how we as Christians, when we start following Jesus, we throw off our old self and put on a new self. There's a new set of characteristics that we put on as followers of Jesus. And and, and when we do that, when we put on the new self, we are not becoming some version of ourselves that doesn't exist. We're becoming more of who we are. We're growing up in our identity. And so in Colossians 3, verses 12 through 15, it starts right there. It says, so as those who have been chosen by God, holy and beloved. He's speaking to us. He's saying, put on a heart. When he's saying put on, those are the words for a new self. Put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bearing with one another. This is why we're here. Bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so you must do also. In addition to these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ, to which you were indeed called in one body, rule in your hearts and be thankful. Wow, these are really powerful words. And we have the opportunity, I actually got to preach on the book of Colossians earlier this year, but, but these scriptures, I'm so excited to dive in deep today, to go line by line, because they are so rich with life and instruction for us as followers of Jesus. 
You know, Paul starts us out when he says, so you have, who have been chosen by God, holy and beloved, he puts our identity in Christ first, and then he commands us to put on. Now, this is, this is calling back to the new self, to put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Now, these are some things. There's times in the Bible where we are instructed to put on things or to take on things that are hard, like pick up your cross and follow Jesus, leave behind all that you have. Those are hard things. But these things like patience and compassion, I mean, these sound like good things. They are attractive. But why are we putting them on? Well, it takes us in the next part of the scripture to a semicolon. If you've ever read Paul's writing before, you know that he loves these compound sentences. His sentences are like two paragraphs long with a semicolon and a dash and a comma and another semicolon. But the, the reason he does this is because Paul loves to put all of his thoughts into one place so that you can understand how they connect to one another. And so he brings us here to this semicolon, and we are putting on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience because we are called to bear with one another and forgive one another. Man, that is like the bread and butter of why people don't like people, right? <laughs> Forgiveness and bearing with one another. Sometimes it's the reason that people don't engage in a church community. We say, we love God. I love God. I love the Bible. I love worship. Bethel's so good, right? We do it from home, but we don't want to be in the presence of others because of conflict and hurt and betrayal. These things lead us to anxiety over relationships and periods of time. So not talking with people that we once loved or walking away from friendships or family or marriages. And in scripture, it says these two things. It says, bear with one another and forgive one another. Now, I have never slowed down enough in this scripture to really pull from it what it's saying. But what I was learning this week is really that these are two different things. I know they sound similar, bearing with one another and forgiving one another, but in the original language, this is speaking to two separate issues of relationships with other people, types of conflict and division. The first being bear with one another. We are commanded to do that. Now, before this week, I would always read that scripture and it would say, bear with one another. And I would kind of fill it in from another part of scripture in my mind, which says, bear one another's burdens. I thought that's what that meant, but that's not what it's getting at. One Bible commentary said it perfectly. It said, when the Bible is saying, bear with one another, what it means is bearing with the failings and the odd ways of our brethren. <laughs> I love that. How many of you know, you know, raise your hand in your living room. How many of you know that some Christians and some people are just odd? They're just a little bit weird. It's so funny because sometimes it's people's oddities, not necessarily the things that they do against us, but the imperfections that just grate you sometimes. You know, the people that you love the most, maybe the people that you live with or have closest relationship with, you know about their oddities, about the weird stuff they do more than anybody else on the planet. And they drive you crazy. One of the things I love about Grace Church is that we are a diverse church. We are a multi-ethnic church. We've got people from all different ethnic backgrounds. We've got people from who are different ages, different socioeconomic status. We've got diversity in our midst. And one of the blessings of that is that we get to spend time with people that we would never have spent time with before. One of the difficulties of that is that the reasons we make decisions in our own life usually comes out of our values. And when somebody has a different background from you, chances are they have a different value system than you do. And so the reasons you make certain decisions and the, and the order of operations in which you, you know, live your life and whether you show up on time or not or which holidays are the ones that you focus on or how you speak to people or who you speak to first in a the room, these sorts of things usually are passed down to us in the way that we're raised. And there are so few places on the planet anymore that we can come into real relationship with other people that are totally different than us. And in the church, we find that. In the church, we spend time with people who do things differently than us in big ways and small ways. 
But, you know, it doesn't matter. I think that, that if we think about this, we know this. It doesn't matter where you come from or what your family background looks like or how much money you have or don't have. We are all incredibly broken people. The Bible teaches us this, that, that because we are all sinners, we are all broken at our core. And some of us have been abused and hurt more than others. But at our core, none of us is perfect. No matter how good you look on stage, no matter how well you speak or sing or lead a small group, no matter what your platform is in your life, every single person will let you down over time because we are all broken. The only one who is not going to let us down is Jesus. And I think it's so incredibly important to address the issue of bearing with one another Because in my experience, though there are hurts that happen in the church, and we will talk about that in a moment, it absolutely happens. There's issues of forgiveness and overstepping of boundaries that happens all the time in church. Though that does exist, in my experience talking with people, the reason people leave church communities usually has more to do with issues of bearing with one another than it does about direct hurt. Like talking with people, I hear stuff that's like, you know, I was attending a small group that I really loved. I was getting a lot out of it, but then this one person would just dominate the conversation. Have you ever been there before? Just dominate the conversation, and I would never get the opportunity to talk. And so I just, I I stopped going. And so now I'm looking for another church. Well, that's not somebody directly hurting you. That's an issue of bearing with one another. Or, or I hear things like, you know, I've noticed the drummer really drags, this isn't at this church, it really drags the tempo and the worship leader just doesn't care. I can't even, I can't even worship, so I'm not even step footing in the, stepping foot in the building. I'm just listening online now. Well, that's, not, that's not an issue of sin. That's an issue of bearing with one another's imperfections, right? Or I love the pastor's preaching and I feel so good when I see them on a Sunday morning or during the week. But, you know, I emailed them two times, and it took them a month to get back to me, so they just don't love me, so I'm leaving the church. You know, these, are these things annoying? Yes, they, they are annoying. <laughs> and, but are they signs of an abusive church? No. Are they a sign of a dead church? No, actually the opposite. They're a sign of a church that's full of life, full of broken people living broken ways. And maybe that pastor needs a new administrator to help them with their emails because they're overloaded. (laughs) But these are issues of bearing with one another. You know, I love that the Bible gives us some clarity to say that even though we can say these are not issues of sin necessarily, we still as believers, remember, this is the first thing it says, we need to put on a heart of compassion. We need to put on kindness and humility, gentleness and patience to deal with these things. Because of our identity in Christ, it is worth it to put on our new selves because we need some extra grace in just bearing with one another. Because here's the thing, there are days where we all need someone to bear with us, right? We know our brokenness, but this is just the realities of relationship. That loving each other, being there for each other, bringing each other meals, becoming each other's refrigerator people, all that kind of stuff just comes with the reality of the brokenness of humanity. And that is going to happen no matter what. But church, it is worth it. It is worth it to bear together and to move forward because the rewards are eternal. But then, of course, there is that other kind of hurt that the scripture speaks of here. Not the passive kind of hurt or that they posted on social media and I disagreed sort of hurt. The direct betrayal, anger, fighting. The thing that requires forgiveness from a broken place that this scripture addresses. Remember, it says, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so you must do also. (laughs) You must do also. Don't you wish that the scripture here said, so you should consider doing under the right circumstances also. 
Just as the Lord forgave you, so you should think about at some point letting go of maybe next year. The scripture says that we, as God forgave us, so we must forgive others also. Now, church, I know forgiveness is so much more of a loaded topic than what we can deep dive into today. But can I just say that this is a subject that is hard for everybody, because it is. You know, when you have been hurt by another person, it can be impossible. It can be, it can feel like an impossible task to move forward. Maybe it was a person who did not live up to their word with you. Maybe they took advantage of you or abused you. Maybe they hurt you unintentionally, or maybe it was entirely intentional. Whatever it was, I just want to say, first of all, I'm so sorry that happened to you. You didn't deserve it. No matter how broken you are, you were not meant to live this life this way. When God created humanity, it was without sin, which means that it was he created humanity for the purpose of having a relationship with him, not broken relationship with each other. The relationship with each other is supposed to draw us together and to glorify God. When others take advantage of others, especially those of you who have been abused, I want you to know that when we talk about this issue of forgiveness, I am not saying that that means you need to allow that person back into that place in your life. God does not want that for you. But this area of forgiveness is so much bigger than just the thing that has happened. Because it is the defining central part of our faith. Have you ever wondered why it is that on a Sunday morning when you come to Grace Church, there is joy in this place? It's because we are a group of people that know what it means and what it is to be forgiven. Our, the central part of humanity's story, because we are Bible-believing Christians who know who our God is, who have experienced his life, we know that all of humanity is crying out for forgiveness because we have done things against God to separate ourselves from him. When we separated ourselves from God in sin, he did everything he could to find us, to redeem us. He sent himself down to this earth to die in our place so that we have the opportunity to be relieved of that pressure and that guilt of the life that we've lived so that we can live in unity with God, forgiveness and relationship. It is beautiful. And I know that there are churches who at times have done things like use the joy that we're supposed to have as Christians as like a gaslighting technique to not let you feel your pain. That is not what I'm trying to do here. What, I'm, what I want us to do is come back to this place where we remember the joy of our salvation. Because if you are a follower of Jesus, can I ask you, how close do you feel to that moment? Is the, is the forgiveness of your sins just fresh on your tongue? Can you feel it? Can you feel the beauty of that moment when you met Jesus? Or is it a distant memory? Because I believe that if we are followers of Jesus and we've experienced the forgiveness of God, that is a determining factor in how easy it is to forgive other people. Not because other people have not wronged us. No, they have. And, and part of the definition of forgiveness is the forgiveness of something that was done wrong. I think that there's such a counterfeit in our culture that says you don't need to forgive because no one's ever done anything wrong, right? It's, it's just their truth and your truth and you just got to let it go and live your own life, set up boundaries and leave. No, there are times when people violate us in ways that we need, that start to live inside of us. And forgiveness is what God calls us to do. Of course, it says, as he forgave you, so you must do also. Forgiveness is not saying that what the person did to you is right. It's letting them go because they were wrong and allowing them into the hands of God. It's a spiritual miracle that every single time brings freedom. That when you operate in a spirit of forgiveness toward others, it brings freedom. If you are someone who has been forgiven, you know that this is true by God or by others. 
but it's so hard to put. I, I struggle to put into words what forgiveness is like because it's not something, it's a supernatural miracle that cannot be explained. It can just be experienced. Forgiveness in scripture is a mandate, but reconciliation is a choice. Forgiving somebody else for something that they have done wrong against you does not mean that you have to then have that same relationship with them again. Sometimes it means reconciliation. If we are quick to settle our debts with one another, if we are quick to go to people and say, I think I might have hurt you, will you forgive me? And then that chasm of relationship does not grow so big that it cannot be crossed. If we are fast to settle our accounts, reconciliation is almost always around the corner. But there are times that we have been violated enough that we can do nothing but separate. However, in our hearts before the Lord, God has called us to forgive. It does not say that what that person did was okay. What it says is that who God is is greater. You know, in my life, when I have walked through the forgiveness, just this last week, before I even got into the scriptures, I found myself in the place that I was facing, oh my gosh, I have to forgive somebody. And I didn't even recognize that it was about to happen. I didn't even recognize that it was something that I needed. But when I found myself two nights in a row, up until midnight, just thinking about a situation over and over and over and over again, and I came to God and I said, God, I have got to let this, I, I, I need you just to take this off my plate. The Lord said, you need to forgive this person. You need to go to this person. It did, hadn't even crossed my mind. But the moment that I recognized that it was an issue of forgiveness, because I have forgiven before, I knew that freedom was around the corner. And I know that that sounds simple, but church today, I want to encourage you, can we seek the unity of the body of Christ through an area of forgiveness? We have more scripture to go into, but I don't, I don't want to pass this moment. I want to pray in the middle of this to ask God into this moment. God, I just pray that wherever we are right now, Lord God, would you give us, just by your spirit, an understanding of who we need to forgive, Lord God, and, a, and just, just a release to be able to forgive those people. Lord God, it is a mystery. But if we are believers, Lord God, I pray that you would help us to experience the joy of our salvation and our forgiveness and to give that out to others. Lord, I pray that you would show us where those boundaries are supposed to be between us and others and show us the way to go about it. In Jesus' name, amen. The thing is, church, is that in this scripture, past this moment, immediately, Paul says, in addition to these things, put on love. This is such an important moment for us because we're not going to go much longer, but I, I just have to take this moment to address this issue of love. You know, I, I, I love that in the scripture beforehand, it tells us to put on compassion and to put on kindness, right? To put on patience so that we can bear with one another and forgive one another. But after that forgiveness is done, Paul encourages us then to put on love. This speaks to how forgiveness, though it may feel like something we have to feel deep in our bones, we may not feel the fuzziness of love toward another person that we are offering forgiveness toward. We may need to put on forgiveness or put on love intentionally as a verb, as an act of love toward one another so that we can move forward. Where, where are we going with this? Love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Unity is, it, it's elusive sometimes in church, but it is the thing that will keep us on mission to bring the gospel to the ends of the earth. It is through the obedience of forgiveness that we put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And from that place, it says, let the peace of Christ to which you were indeed called in one body rule over your hearts and be thankful. 
Church, my challenge to you today is can we seek bearing with one another and forgiving one another so that love may rule in this place, so that peace may rule in this place? Because in this world, this world where chaos is everywhere, us as believers walking ruled by the peace of Christ are going to win people to his side in a minute. But sometimes the first thing we need to do is forgive each other for where we have hurt each other. Let's just pray one more time. Lord, we love you. God, I pray that today as we go back into our world, back into our home, into our community, Lord God, we would lift you up. God, I pray that we would be ambassadors of your love and your peace, forgiving one another and bearing with one another. In your name we pray, amen. Be blessed, church.